Jerry's a little bit under the weather tonight, so I'm going to take the lead, but I'll show you some photos. We'll play some music, and Jerry's going to uh, recount some stories about how some of the peaks got named. And uh, you all, Colorado Mountain Club members, um, probably know that uh, Colorado Mountain Club is a big part of the climbing of many of these peaks and the naming of some of the peaks uh, also. So it's uh, great to be with you all, the Pikes Peak group um, tonight. And I see we've got about a hundred folks looking in and that's a fantastic turnout. So thanks so much for having us and for coming tonight. So I'll just give you a quick genesis of the project. Jerry, of course, uh, she started working on this several years ago and I was uh, in Steamboat Springs, March 7th, 2020, uh, just finished up teaching a winter photography workshop up there to a handful of people because COVID had started to spread. And, and that Sunday evening at about seven o'clock, Governor Polis announced that there was gonna be no more ski season. And I was wondering what I was gonna do for the next two months. So I drove from Steamboat to my home which is at 9,400 feet in the Williams Fork Mountains, 10 miles north of Silverthorne above the lower Blue River Valley. So I'm looking out my window right now at the Slate Creek drainage of the Gore Range, the east side of the Gore Range. So that's where I live. And I got home Sunday night. And then Monday morning, I got an email from a lady named Jerry Norgren who said she'd been researching uh, how all the 58 in this case, which is the Colorado Geological Survey's number of 14ers, uh, got named, asked me if I thought there was a book in this and that she had already approached the University of New Mexico Press and talked to them about doing perhaps a black and white only, um, more scholarly text with a few historical sketches type of a book. And what did I think? And I told her I thought that was a great idea. Um, but I wasn't interested because I don't really publish anything but my own photo books these days. And then that night I couldn't sleep. And it wasn't because of the altitude. It was because I started thinking, you know, even though I never really set out in my 40 year career to photograph 14ers, given that I've been across and on just about each of Colorado's 66 million acres and up almost every single subalpine and alpine drainage in each of 28 mountain ranges in Colorado and waited at sunrise and sunset to photograph reflections of 12ers and 13ers and 14ers in those ponds. <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, I bet I probably have most of the 14ers in my photos if I just go back and, and uh, look through 25,000 four by five inch color transparencies during my heyday from 1982 to 2010, when I switched to digital, you know, I used this big German Linhof. Um, so over the next couple of weeks, I went through all of these four by five inch transparencies in trays, which are in those cabinets right over there. And I came up with photos of maybe 37 or 38 of the 58 14ers. And then I said to Jerry, you know, maybe there's a coffee table book in this idea. And then she said, yeah. And, uh, the Hayden survey artists, um, you know, did historical sketches and we could put those sketches because they're in the public domain in the book too. And then I started thinking, um, and you know, I know a man named Bob Wogren. Back in the nineties, he proposed a project of uh, doing a calendar about the 58, 14,000 foot peaks that he had painted with oils. And uh, I started putting two and two and three and three together. And I realized that with Jerry's 70,000 words, which is what it ultimately turned out to be about this fascinating history, not just of how the peaks got named, but who first climbed them and, and stories about uh, life on the trail, just like we have our own stories. The stories from the 19th century were incredibly fascinating. And that with the photos and the artwork, the historical sketches, um, maybe we could come up with all 58 14ers. And she thought that was a good idea. So I started accounting for all 58 and I came up two peaks uh, short, Culebra 
and Cameron. So he called my buddy, world-class mountain climber, John Kudrowski from Vail, who you may know has been on top of Everest and he was just on the K2 expedition um, in March and survived that, thank goodness. And he did a book called Sleeping on the Summits back when where he slept on top of all the 14ers and took photos at sunrise and sunset. And John came up with Cameron and Culebra for me. So we had a book. And uh, by the end of March, I had hired gra my graphic designer, editor and proofreader. And to make a long story short, between end of March and June 15th, we put together 160 pages with 150 pieces of artwork and photography and 70,000 words of text and graphically designed it and sent it off to the printer in Hong Kong on June 15th. And by September 15th, 2020, we had a, a book in the bookstores or at least online because things were, were shutting down at that point. And uh, since then we sold the first printing and the second printing came in in March and we're now working our way through the second printing. So it's been, been very popular We've done, what, Jerry, 50 of these Zoom slideshows since the book came out, maybe. So yeah. I am, that's the <clears throat> genesis of the project. I'm going to screen share, and, um, and then in a minute, Jerry's going to start telling you some great history. So that's the front and back cover of the book. And uh, we're gonna <clears throat> break, break this show into three sections. So three pieces of music and uh, two sets of stories for each of the sections, multiple mountain ranges for each sections. And we're gonna be quiet at one point and just let you listen to beautiful music and and uh, watch the artwork. So Jerry, I'm gonna hand it over to you um, to talk about uh, the front and the mosquito and the 10 mile ranges. Thanks, John. And thank you, Joe, for <clears throat> organizing this and for everybody that's attended. Um, the one thing about the book <clears throat> is that if you are just interested in reading about say Sunlight Peak, you can just go to that section and read that. You don't have, it's not a front to back book. So if you're only interested in, you know, finding out the names of the, you know, 14 years you're gonna climb this coming summer, then you can do it that way. So, um, and as John mentioned, in the course of my research, I came across Colorado Mountain Club's involvement just all the time, which was, it was really fun to see. So I'm gonna, <clears throat> start with the front range with um, Mount Evans and then the cute little story of how the Mosquito Range got its name. During the 1860s, the Colorado Territory experienced substantial growth. Mining was in full swing. The government surveyors were diligently at work. Denver was growing and attracting settlers and many curious East Coast travelers, writers, and artists were making the trip west to see firsthand the beauty they had only heard and read about. One such artist was the renowned landscape painter, Albert Beardstadt. Along with the journalist and author, Fitzhugh Ludlow and two other traveling companions, Beardstadt arrived in Denver in June of 1863. Beardstadt wished to gather mountain sketches and scenes from which to create a great Rocky Mountain picture. Ludlow was to chronicle the trip and the other two were along just for the pleasure of it. Bertstadt was introduced to William Newton Byers, founder and editor of the Rocky Mountain News, who would serve as his guide into the mountains. On June 17th, they departed Denver and headed up Chicago Creek to the base of the Chicago Mountains, with Bertstadt stopping, sketching, and painting along the way. Upon reaching the summit of the highest unnamed peak in the group, Bertstadt suggested the glorious peak be named Rosalie for the wife of his traveling companion, Fitzhugh Ludlow. This certainly was a grand romantic gesture as well as a glimpse of events to come because in a few years, Rosalie Osborne Ludlow would become Mrs. Albert Beardstadt upon her divorce from Ludlow. This the same year that Beardstadt's now famous painting, Storm in the Rocky Mountains, Mount Rosalie debuted to wide acclaim. In 1872, during a political excursion to Greeley in celebration of the completion of the Union Pacific Railroad, 
The idea of changing the name of Mount Rosalie to Mount Evans was set in motion. Second territorial governor, John Evans had been instrumental in helping establish the railroad and this was an effort to honor him. It is not clear which peak they had in mind. So the name of Mount Evans came into use along with that of Mount Rosalie. Fast forward 22 years after the unofficial christening of Mount Evans to December of 1894, when a member of the Denver Fortnightly Club presented the matter of having the name of Mount Evans made legal by the next legislation. The Denver Fortnightly Club is a women's literary club founded in 1881 with Mrs. John Evans as a founding member and its first president. In March, 1895, Governor Albert McIntyre signed the bill a few days before Governor Evans's 81st birthday, making it official. The name of Mount Rosalie continued to remain in use for many more years until the name of Rosalie Peak was given to a 13,575 foot mountain to the southeast of Mount Evans. Overshadowed by the fame and beauty of the Front Range Mount Evans is a second Mount Evans or Mount Evans B as it is commonly called, residing in the Mosquito Range northeast of Leadville and two miles from Mount Sherman. This 13,577 foot peak gained its name from local miners in the early 1860s when John Evans was territorial governor. In 1916, Roger Toll of the Colorado Mountain Club wrote to the USGS requesting a name change for this peak because there was already a much more prominent Mount Evans and at times it became confusing as to which was which. The USGS reached out to the Leadville Postmaster who responded that the name of Evans frequently appears in the work of Professor F.S. Emmons's U.S. Geological Survey of the Leadville Mining District. The names of Mount Evans, Evans Amphitheater and Evans Gulch are all mentioned often in Emmons's work and to change the name would lead to great confusion in the reading of his works, which are the Leadville Mining Man's Bible. So the name remains today. And this is a quick story about how the Mosquito Range came upon its name. Parallel to the Front Range and about 40 miles west lies the Mosquito Range, which has an interesting story surrounding its name. As you have no doubt figured out, the name Mosquito comes from the pesky insects known to swarm the area in the early summer, which in turn spawned a frenzy of naming of a great many geographical features in their dubious honor. The Mosquito Range, Mosquito Pass, Mosquito Gulch, and Mosquito Peak, all named after this bothersome insect. The story of the first use of Mosquito as moniker goes like this. In 1861, a group of miners met to discuss a suitable title for their new mining district. A consensus could not be reached, so a blank space was left in the recorder's book and the men adjourned. A short time later, they returned to resume deliberations and upon opening the recorder's book, discovered a squashed mosquito gracing the space where the name was to be recorded. With that as a sign, the men all agreed to name their mining district Mosquito Gulch. And soon after the name was given to many other features in the area although often misspelled on early maps as M-U-S-Q-U-I-T-O. Now we're gonna have Thank some- Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> Thanks, Jerry. Uh -huh. um, so this painting you've been looking at while Jerry told her stories is one of Bob Wogren's uh, paintings. When I hooked up with Jerry, we I called Bob. I didn't know he was, even alive, but he turned out that it, since the 90s, he still existed and he was 93 last year when we engaged him in the project and he lives in Lakewood with his daughter. But, but Bob was a architectural painter. So before um, Photoshop, you know, if an architect needed a rendering of a, of a um, building that they had uh, designed, they would hire somebody like Bob to do a painting of the design. And he got tired of doing that. So in the 90s, he decided to hike to at least the base of all 58 14ers, if not climb them, if he had time. And he would do uh, pencil sketches and then he would go home and finish it up with his oils. So in the artwork in the book and in the show tonight, you're gonna see not only historical sketches done by a couple of the official uh, artist that Ferdinand Hayden hired from 1870 to 1878 for his, you know, the big Hayden survey of the West by the US government. Um, but you're gonna see some of Bob's 
uh, pencil sketches too, as well as his paintings. And all of this allowed us to depict all 58 of the peaks. And then right now you're gonna see the front range, the mosquito range, and then the 10 mile range. And at the end of the 10 mile range, you're gonna see a William Henry Jackson photo of uh, Quandry. And, you know, Jackson was the official photographer of the, uh, of the Hayden survey. So Hayden hired him to do the photography and you, you probably know that in 1998, I drove um, 25,000 miles and backpacked 508 and a half months in order to stand in three places where Jackson stood to make his photos all over again for that project, Colorado 1870 to 2000, which ended up being three different books. The one you know people know best is that big brown simulated leather book, which finally went out of print after 22 years this year. But volume two, which is the rest of the project is still in print. And, uh, you know, I did that project back in the day when I was carrying 65 pounds of German Lindhoff large format equipment on my on my back, basically from about 1984 to 2010. Uh, I hauled uh, the fold up metal alloy four by five, a big Manfrotto tripod, 30 sheet film holders, 500 sheets of ectochrome, and then I moved into Fujichrome film, seven lenses, all in uh, what uh, Greg Lowe, the cinema photographer designed. It was called the Lowe Super Tracker Pack. It was the only pack that would carry cinema. And then in my case, all this large format gear. And I carried that up and down mountains, over ridges, from one drainage to the next, even on top of 14ers. So Jackson was on top of about, about five 14ers. So I hauled 65 pounds on my back to the top of Long's Peak, for example, because Jackson and that project did about five really cool shots on the traditional route up to the top of Long's Peak. And that resulted in two titanium chromium knees, one titanium cobalt hip, which actually worked better than flesh. Um, I'm doing the same things today I've done all my life. And uh, I recommend all of you get titanium, whether you need it or not. It's, you don't even need Advil anymore. So, I'm going to click the button and you're going to get to see the front range, the mosquito range and the 10 mile ranges with my favorite classical composer, Johannes Brahms in the background. Please enjoy. And there's that same drainage, Chicago Lakes that you just saw in Bob's painting.
I hand it over to, to Jerry, just uh, um, an explanation. You know, Hayden and his surveyors and his artist and his photographer were on top of all these mountains because with their transit, their, it was called a theodolite and to do their triangulation in order to map the courses of rivers and creeks and measure the heights of peaks, they had to be on top of peaks with you know, views to other peaks to be able to use that equipment. So everybody in the Hayden survey was climbing mountains, just like you all, all the time. So Jerry's gonna uh, talk now about, uh, I think Sawatch Range, but this section is the Sawatch Range, including the Collegiate Peaks, the Sangre de Cristos and the Elk Mountains between Aspen and Crested Butte. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry, you are uh, you're you need to unclick your mute button. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, start over. Okay. <clears throat> so this uh, the first one's about Mount Massive, and then the second story is um, from the Sangres. The story of this peak's name is one of my favorites because of the fortitude and resolve the citizens of Leadville and Lake County showed when it came to protecting this peak's name. Lying just a few miles to the west of Leadville on the Sawatch Range. The peak was given its name in 1873 by Henry Gannett, topographer with the Hayden Survey. He stated that the mountain named itself, its broad heavy outline suggesting the name at once. Earlier locals and miners had simply called it Massive Mountain. As Leadville grew from its humble beginning as a mining camp, the town and its citizens played an important and unusual role they never would have expected, that of protecting the name of their beloved mountain. It all began in 1901 when the first of three name change attempts was launched. That year following the assassination of President William McKinley, the editors of the Denver Post took it upon themselves to recognize and commemorate the life of the 25th president by changing the name of Mount Massive to that of Mount McKinley. The editors ran a succession of articles with one particular headline accompanied by a large photo of Mount Massive declaring, that Mount Massive seen from a distance is to be renamed Mount McKinley. With Mount Massive residing only a few miles from Leadville and an important geographic icon for the town, it is not surprising that the citizens of the town and surrounding Lake County had strong opinions otherwise. Letters were written, newspaper articles published and petitions signed, all in opposition of robbing the mountain of its name. The collective voice of the people was heard and the Denver Post dropped its name change campaign and the citizens were at peace knowing they had helped their beloved mountain retain its name. That is until 1915, when a Leadville miner suggested renaming the peak in honor of Henry Gannett, who had recently passed away. 
<clears throat> Again, much opposition with passionate letters written, articles in the papers, and even a poignant poem written by the editor of Leadville's newspaper, The Herald Democrat. After much back and forth between the Colorado and US geographic boards, it seemed as if the matter was put to rest and the name of Mount Massive would remain. But in 1922, the new, the new USGS maps came out and on the Leadville quad was the name of Gannett Peak. Whether in place of Mount Massive's name or on one of Mount Massive's highest summits remains uncertain because all the maps were swiftly destroyed due to the uproar it caused. After what was considerable opposition, the USGS reconsidered and removed Gannett's name from Mount Massive and instead gave it to the highest peak in Wyoming in the Wind River Range. Everyone was happy in knowing they had thwarted name change attempt number two. However, in 1965, a young state senator from Denver launched a third proposal to rename the peak Mount Sir Winston Churchill following the prime minister's death. Considering Churchill had no ties whatsoever to Colorado and its mountains, this fight to reject the proposal was short-lived and swift. Mount Massive withstood three name change attempts. It reigned victorious each time thanks to the dogged determination and loyalty of the citizens of Leadville, Lake County, and the state of Colorado. After 147 years, it appears that the name is here to stay. And then here's the um, story of Challenger Point. Challenger Point was the last and most recent 14er to receive its name which is much more than just a name, it is an emotional tribute. Located in the Sangre de Cristo range, Challenger Point is a sub-peak of Kit Carson Peak. Following the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger on January 28, 1986, Dennis Williams, a resident of Colorado Springs, proposed to the US Board on Geographic Names the name of Challenger Point to commemorate the seven crew members who lost their lives. The BGN deferred for one year in accordance with their rule at the time which stated that the intended honoree of a new name must have been deceased for at least a year. Over the course of the next year, an impressive amount of grassroots support was generated in favor of the name. And on April 9th, 1987, the BGN officially approved the designation of Challenger Point. On, Je on July 18th, 1987, five people placed a bronze memorial plaque on the summit honoring the astronauts. The idea was initiated by Fort Collins resident Alan Silverstein, and the six by 12 inch plaque reads as follows. Challenger Point, 14,080 plus feet, in memory of the crew of Shuttle Challenger, seven who died accepting the risk, expanding man's horizon. January 28, 1986. At Astra Paraspera, which is a Latin phrase meaning to the stars through hardships. Gary, will you please tell the members of the Mountain Club, um, where you got your history? What were the what were the sources for all of this? I went to the Western History section of the Denver Public Library, which was an invaluable resource. The National Archives up north, which is where I saw the originals of the sketches John was talking about from the Hayden survey. And I read their field notebooks and everything like that. Um, USGS Library in Lakewood, um, the Alpine Library, which is next is in the same building as the Mountain Club's offices in Golden, um, History Colorado, and an online resource called um, the Hathi Trust, which is a repository of um, old works and field notes and everything like that, that universities across the United States have. So I was able to oh. access a, a lot of those. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, all of the public domain archival history, the sketches and the text, you know, from the Hayden survey and the Wheeler survey and all those surveys. Tell everybody, uh, you know, how, how wonderful it is to have all that in the public domain and any of us, all of us can go get it whenever we want. Oh yeah, so when I was up at the National Archives, um, you work with a, with a, a, a one person um, when you go up there and they know the project you're working on and you tell them what it is you're trying to discover and um, then they bring everything out on a cart to you and you have to sit in a special room. So one of the thing, and then you, first you go through these big books though and it tells you what they have. And then that's, you know, you can say, oh, and I want this and I want this. So when they brought out, um, it was a whole couple of portfolios of these actual sketches on some of it was just very thin tissue paper. And you'll see in some of the sketches how they're jagged on the edges. 
And this was the only way they had of recording it because even though William Henry Jackson was with the survey, um, he wasn't crawling around as, you know, as, as John mentioned, carrying all that heavy equipment. He wasn't around, you know, he wasn't everywhere that these guys were. So if they're on a top of a summit, um, you know, they would draw and sketch what they were seeing. And those were their notes that when they went back to do the reports that they could refer to these things. And I asked the man who was my researcher um, how I could possibly, um, you know, be able to use these pictures. And he said they're, they've all been digitized and they're in the public domain, which I just, I just found amazing. And he says, and nobody really has used them or cared about them. And I know you were pretty amazed about it, John, when I told you about them. Yeah, I mean, that was music to my ears because I needed the media and uh, it's all online. It's high res scans of, uh, of the artwork and it doesn't cost a thing. It's in the public domain. So it just made the process of designing the book um, so much easier. Well, thanks a lot for um, <clears throat> telling us where the history came from. So. Like I said, the next four mountain ranges you're gonna see are the, actually three, the Sawatch Range, including the Collegiate Peaks, the Sangre de Cristos, and uh, uh, the Elk Ranges. And Jerry, while we're looking at this, you might be thinking too about, I don't know if you've got it in your uh, San Juan stories, but a little bit about um, what part Colorado Mountain Club, you know, played in the naming, if not climbing of some of these peaks, you know, that's in the book. No big deal if you can't, can't okay. take out some of that. But CMC uh, is all over this book, everybody. So, um, but you got to get a copy of the book. To, mm -hmm. And I'll tell you how you can do that at the end of the show. Um, so in that last sequence, you saw Chasm Lake below Long's Peak at sunrise. And how do you, you know, other than getting up in the dark, get to Chasm Lake at sunrise? Well, I've been very fortunate over the years and I've been able to con, con the powers that be into letting me do things they might not do otherwise or for other people. So in the case of Rocky Mountain National Park in 1993 and four, I think to this day, I'm still the only person that the Park Service gave a permit to. For two years, I was allowed to go and camp wherever I wanted to camp in the, in the 300 square mile, yeah, let's see, what is it? 300 square miles of Rocky Mountain National Park. So I pretty much hiked up every drainage 90% of the time off trail, sleeping at the Alpine, subalpine lake at night so I could be Johnny on the spot for reflection photography at sunrise and then at sunset. Uh, climb Long's Peak with all that camera gear to do the repeat photography, but basically got to be at and photograph each of 155 alpine and subalpine lakes in the park. And then in this sequence of photos, you're gonna see, uh, you know, one of my favorite mountain ranges, the Elk Mountains between Aspen and Crested Butte. And in 1992, a writer from Boulder, Tom Barron and I spent 30 straight days in the Maroonville Snowmass Wilderness doing the same thing. Um, in this case, we use llamas and backpacks. The Rocky Mountain Park Project was all backpacking. But we went up every drainage, photographed every lake, climbed a lot of the peaks, um, pretty much got to see all the nooks and crannies of, of the Elk Mountains. So I hope you enjoy this music. My second favorite classical composer, Felix Mendelssohn.
Mount Gale over there on the right and uh, Harvard on the left.
that Castle Peak photo and um, the uh, actually two of the Castle Peak photos are made on backcountry hut trips, which is the way that I do my winter photography is end up at a hut or a yurt. You know, we've got over a hundred in Colorado. Makes my job a little easier if I've got a cot or bed to sleep in and then head up in the dark at 6 a.m., get to a ridge at 12 and a half thousand feet. Now with the digital camera before sunrise, photograph twilight, um, like you saw, that was twilight above the Lindley hut of Castle Peak with the moon uh, setting, full moon setting. And that's that was Alpenglow. And Alpenglow is not that first direct orange light on the peaks. Alpenglow is the reflection of twilight on the peaks. And it takes about a six or seven second exposure on the tripod to be able to get that kind of illumination. So the last mountain range that Jerry and I are going to show and talk about is actually about six mountain ranges all rolled into one, the Great San Juan Mountains of Southwestern Colorado. And Jerry's got a couple of stories for you. Thanks, John. But before we leave the Elk Mountains, just a quick aside, um, <clears throat> when, the Hay when Hayden survey and the men were doing their surveys each summer, um, they named a lot of the peaks. And when they got to the Elk Range, they had this conjured up this plan to name it the National Range. And they were gonna name the highest peaks after buildings in Washington, DC, which Capitol Peak did, that one did last. Um, Snowmass, they had named the White House. There was Treasury Mountain, Post Office. I mean, they were just gonna name them all after that. But then they um, found out that the locals had been calling it the Elk Range for many, many years. And so they decided to stay with that. But, I thought that was a, a fun story about um, naming them after buildings in DC. So this story of um, Sunshine Peak, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to having been on top of peaks and storms, but this one is, um, this one's unbelievable. The story, the tale of the first descent of Sunshine Peak is made all the more interesting due to the writing of assistant topographer, Franklin Rhoda. Situated in the Southern San Juan Mountains, this peak qualifies for the Colorado Geological Survey's list of 14ers by a mere foot and is in jeopardy of losing its status when new advanced measurements will be released in 2022. The first official ascent was made in 1874 by two members of the Hayden Survey, Franklin Rhoda and A.D. Wilson, after whom Mount Wilson and Wilson Peak were named. As topographers with the survey, they used Sunshine Peak as they did many other high peaks, as a triangulation station for getting measurements of the surrounding mountains. These peaks were often referred to as stations and assigned only a number with no name. Sunshine Peak was merely station 12 on their maps and didn't receive its name until 1906, which was given by the US Geological Survey with no reason for the name. Prior to the surveys of 1873 and 74, the peak had the previous names of Niagara Peak and Sherman Mountain, but neither were acknowledged by either the Hayden or the Wheeler surveys. Franklin Rhoda's documentation of the summer of 1874 for the Hayden Survey Report is entitled Report on the Topography of the San Juan Country and is masterfully and beautifully written. His description of the electrical storm they experienced while on the summit of Sunshine Peak captures the readers so thoroughly they, they could imagine they were there as well as illustrating how dedicated these men were to their jobs. Once on the summit, Rhoda and Wilson had barely started their work when they began to feel a tickling sensation in their hair. And as Rhoda tells it, at first this sensation was only perceptible and not at all troublesome. Still, its strength surprised us since the cloud causing it was several miles distant to the Southwest of us. By holding up our hands above our heads, a tickling sound was produced, which was still louder if we held a hammer or other instrument in our hand. The tickling sensation above mentioned increased quite, increased quite regularly at first and presently was accompanied by a peculiar sound, almost like that produced by the frying of bacon. We felt that we could not stop, though the frying of our hair became louder and more disagreeable, for certain parts of the drainage of this region could not be seen from any other peak, and we did not want to ascend this one a second time. They continued working until the lightning strokes were coming quicker and quicker, and according to Rhoda, only separated by two to three minutes of time, and we knew our peak would soon be struck. The instruments were producing a terrible humming, 
which with the noises emitted by the thousands of angular blocks of stone and the sounds produced by their hair made such a din they could scarcely think. The duo made a mad dash for it and headed down as quickly as possible and finally reached their camp late at night, thoroughly drenched, tired, and hungry. Rhoda humorously shares his thoughts regarding the ending of their harrowing day. If I could end the history of the adventures of this remarkable day by describing how we were pleasantly housed in dry, comfortable quarters and how we contentedly wrapped the drapery of our couch above us and laid a pleasant dreams, I would. But alas, how the romance would be taken out of the story if I should tell you how we crawled into our low, short and narrow little tents with the water running under the edges and leaking through at the top and how we had to lie as still as possible lest we might disturb the pools of water gradually, gradually collecting on our blankets and precipitate them into the inner recesses of our bedclothes. All this and more shall I leave untold. And this is the story of El Dante. Located in the sub range of the San Juan Mountains known as the San Miguel Mountains, El Dante was not attempted by the men of the Hayden Survey in the summer of 1874. They did, however, climb neighboring Mount Wilson and gave only a mere mention to El Dante in their report. Quote, to the west and quite near was a pretty high peak, end quote. It wouldn't be until July 4th, 1930 that the mountain was first descended and named by Dwight Lavender and two other men, or so it was thought. Lavender called it El Dante, which in Spanish means the tooth, because the peak's ragged outline resembled many teeth. A few months after his climb, Lavender came across an article in an 1891 issue of an Alpine journal written by Percy Thomas, where he talks about his climb at Mount Wilson in 1890. As Lavender delved into the de details of the article, he began to realize that the peak Thomas claimed to have climbed was not Mount Wilson, but indeed El Dante. In, 1931, in a 1931 article for the Colorado Mountain Club's Trail and Timberline, Lavender explains in detail how he came to this conclusion and assigns the first descent to Thomas. At an early age, Dwight Lavender took an enthusiastic interest in mountaineering and exploration, and with two others would form the core of an energetic group known as the San Juan Mountaineers, and they would contribute more to the knowledge of mountaineering in the San Juans than any other group. Unfortunately, the mountaineering community would never fully realize all that Lavender was capable of contributing. In 1934, after returning to Stanford University to resume, resume his graduate studies in geology, he died suddenly from polio at the age of 23. Few have contributed more to the sport in such a short time than Dwight Lavender. He is remembered by a peak named in his honor, Lavender Peak, located in the La Plata Mountains near Durango. So, thank you, Jerry. Uh -huh. does, does leaky tents uh, conjure up any of your own stories? So leaky tents have been happening apparently since at least 18. 70, what was it, Jerry? 73. Sometime? 1873, so you're not alone. Nor, if I had hair, those of you that do have hair, hair standing on end, that continues to happen too. So that photograph you've been looking at, sunshine on the left, red cut on the right, I made that from that high point on the Colorado Trail between the headwaters of the Rio Grande and Lake City, I think 13.4 on the Colorado Trail is that high point. And if you climb up over the ridge, you can see sunshine and red cloud to the north. So now you're going to see the, the San Juan Mountains, the 14ers. And uh, one of my two favorite mountain ranges in Colorado, one of which is right out this window, the Gore Range, and the other of which are the Needles and um, Wyndham, Sunlight, Eolus, North Eolus. And uh, that's about as good as life gets. I mean, the Gore Range is just as good for me because this east side that I'm looking at didn't get trailed by the Civilian Conservation Corps back in the 1930s. So no 14ers, but uh, the drainages of the east side of the Eagle's Nest wilderness are as rugged and remote as any in the needles and over the years I've had the pleasure of doing two complete traverses both east side and west side of the needles starting um, from the south on the west side and going up 
uh, New York Creek and Ten Mile Creek and No Name Creek and actually humping it over the ridges from one high cirque to another and Vestal Creek and out Elk Creek and that was about a eight day trip and then <clears throat> another trip we did for nine days from Hunchback Pass south over uh, all of those eastern drainages just kind of winding our way in and out of the 13ers and the 14ers on the crest of the needles, Leviathan Lake and Sunlight Lakes. And in my book, that's about as good as mountain ranges get. And I've been around the world to a lot of mountain ranges and around the American West. And these photos you're gonna see of the needles and of Ongumbagre for that matter too, just doesn't get any better than this. So please enjoy and we're gonna put my old favorite Johannes Brahms behind this sequence of photos and art and uh, please enjoy.
so that last photograph on the left was Snuffles, and that's from uh, Last Dollar Ranch. And if you think of uh, all the press conferences that Governor Hickenlooper and now Governor Polis give in their office in the state capitol, that's the photo that you always see in the background. Back in uh, when Hickenlooper was first elected, he called me up and said he needed, he had an eight by 14 foot wall and he needed to brighten up his office. And that was the ultimately the photo that he chose kind of a merger of humanity and ranching and beautiful mountains um, at the same time. So that's the book. Um, I don't even know who, if you even have an independent bookstore in Colorado Springs anymore. I mean, it used to be Mackenzie White. Uh, I know you got a couple of Barnes and Nobles, but that's our first hope that you go to your local bookstore and, and get the book. But backup plan is Amazon. They're, they're in stock now. Like I said, the second printing was delivered in March. So we got plenty of books to go around. Only $45 for all of Jerry's hard work. And uh, you will make her happy. And with that said, thank you, Colorado Mountain Club for uh, Pikes Peak Group for having us today. And um, we'd love to open it up to questions for either of us if anybody has any. Wait, let me just interject though that the um, Colorado Mountain Club at their offices in Golden, they have the book. Is it on their website still? Yes, and it's still on their website and they have books in stock um, at the office. Okay, so you can buy it um, from the Mountain Club, you know, from the, even though the press didn't, Colorado Mountain Club Press didn't publish it, they, they'll sell it to you. Thank you. Yeah, and they have books, they do have boxes of books. So, and <clears throat> um, Covered Treasures and Monument also carries the book. All right, well, John and Jerry, this is Joe Kalis again. Thanks so much for your, your time this evening and putting everything together. Fantastic to learn more about the state. And I know I am certainly inspired to get out more and start hiking and climbing as much as we can this spring and winter. It looks like we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, one of the first questions was, what is the website for the public domain of the historic peak images? Of, of the what? Uh, I think there's something John had mentioned, the public domain website for the historic peak images. For the historic, for the art? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, I didn't catch that last word. Jerry's got that info. I think. Yeah, I didn't either. It's just um, the national, I don't know the website address, but it's the National Archives in Denver. And but go when you Google, just Google um, Hayden Survey artwork, and I think it's the national. But there's a few websites, you know, that that you'll end up finding this stuff on. Even like the USGS, US Geological Survey, the National Archives website. Just Google it, and it'll take you there. Just search for Hayden Survey, Hayden Survey art, and you'll find it. Well, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, I think some of this may have been addressed in the presentation, but if you could clarify for us, what is the quote Brown book unquote that you mentioned at the beginning of the hour? I think it was one of the books that you had previously published. So that was that uh, what we call repeat photography book that I did for the millennium change from 1999 to 2000, where I stood I found 300 William Henry Jackson locations that he made photos of from 1870 to uh, 1908. And I pointed my camera on its tripod in the exact same direction that Jackson did 100 years before me and framed the photos the same way and published a large coffee table book of these repeat photos to show how Colorado had changed or not for the better, for the worse, over up to 130 years. And that book was in print, like I said, from 1999 until this year. You can still find a few copies 
online for sale, new, new copies, but they're almost gone. And then I did another book um, with more of the project because we couldn't fit the whole project in one book. So the title of the books are Colorado 1870-2000. All right, and thank you for that, sir. Looks like we've got one final question. And that question is, any thoughts on the potential renaming of Mount Evans? <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> um, I just, I don't, I'm, it's becoming such a, now I think there's five names now, um, five proposed names. It's a thorn, it's gonna be a thorny issue. That's for sure in the, Colorado Name Changing Board is certainly has their work cut out for them um, with all the different entities. And uh, apparently I heard um, from the USGS that the proposals from the different tribes of the Arapaho Cheyenne, they don't even agree on the names that each tribe has proposed. So um, it's gonna take a long time. And the point is, if you think this is unique, remember Jerry's story about Mount Massive? I mean, Naaman Peaks has been controversial for 150 years, so this is nothing new, but the cultural and um, racial issues that come up today certainly are different, in, in my opinion, merit attention. All right, well, I did also wanna point out to those still in the audience that some of our or digitally astute audience members have included a link to the archives.gov website, as well as a link to the cmcpress.org website where you can purchase John and Jerry's book that they presented to us on this evening. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank John and Jerry both personally on behalf of the Pikes Peak chapter of the Colorado Mountain Club. It certainly was our pleasure to host you this evening. Um, we look forward to seeing more of your work in the future. But with that, we'll sign off. I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye.